Good evening, everyone. My name is Jay Parsons, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's webinar titled Highlights from the Leading Edge Project with Dr. Ron Lewis presenting and brought to you by the Let's Grow Committee of the American Sheep Industry Association. I'd like to start by thanking them for their support of this webinar and invite you to visit their website to learn more about the American sheep industry and how to be successful in the sheep business. The URL for the ASI website is www.sheepusa.org, and you can access the Let's Grow materials by clicking the link for it on their homepage. I'd like to remind our listeners that this webinar is being recorded, and all webinar registrants will receive a follow-up email about 24 hours after the webinar that will have a direct link to the recording and a link that you can use to access the webinar slides. We're slated for about a 50 minute presentation and then that'll be followed by about a 20 minute Q&A session. Uh, you don't have to wait till the Q&A session to type your questions in. Uh, there is a question bo dialogue box on your control panel that you can type those in uh, at any time during the presentation or during the Q&A session. And then, uh, and then I'll be moderating those questions to our speaker. And he will be joined by some of the members of the uh, research team that helped with this project. And he'll introduce those uh, when that time rolls around and, and say a little bit about their role in the project. And uh, we're really happy to have all those folks on to help with that Q&A session at the end. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and get us started here by introducing our speaker, Dr. Ron Lewis, who's a professor in animal science at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, specializing in animal breeding and genomics. Uh, Dr. Lewis has a bachelor's degree in animal science from the University of California, Davis, master's degree in animal breeding from Texas A&M, and a PhD in animal science from Virginia Tech University. His international work experience includes two, a two-year stint in Western Australia as a geneticist and nine years as an animal breeding specialist and leader of the sheep breeding section of the Scottish Agricultural College in Edinburgh, Scotland. Domestically, he had a 12 or 13 year uh, stint at Virginia Tech University in animal genetics before uh, coming to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in 2014. So uh, a lot of people are really excited about this project. It's one of the um, highlights of the Let's Grow program, very applied and, and we're all interested in seeing how the, some of these results have turned out uh, with this great work that Dr. Lewis is doing with his team. So with that, I'm gonna go, I know he's got a lot of material to cover and I'm gonna go ahead and turn the, uh, uh, program over to him and I'll be back in about 45 or 50 minutes to help with the Q&A session. So Dr. Lewis, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Jay. I very much appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to talk about this project. And I want to, to be clear uh, right up front, this is very much a group effort. And although I'm presenting the material this evening, the whole team of individuals who've been engaged have made it come to be and have actually made it a, a really enjoyable experience to be involved in. And so I want to make sure everyone understands uh, there's a lot of people who've done a lot of really good work to have this come to fruition. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, at least introduce what I hope to, to visit with you about tonight. Um, I'll talk a bit about the objectives of the project. And the way that I think it's best to tell this story is to think of it in terms of a production system. That's certainly how I think of it as a production enterprise. And the beauty of it is it really takes us from the very start, the point where we select rams, all the way through breeding, lambing the ewes, weaning those lambs, finishing and harvesting the, uh, the lambs at, at the very end. So it's this entire picture of what happens in a standard production system. So that's how I look at it, and that's how I'm going to tell the story tonight uh, for you. But there is a, some starting points that I want to begin with, and that is to, to thank our sponsors. This work would not have been possible without the support of the ASI Let's Grow granting program. It was fundamental to allow this to go forward. The Leading Edge Group has very much benefited from that support. The project that I'm going to speak about tonight was funded for $35,000. Overall, there's been about $66,000 going towards the Leading Edge effort. And 
it's sort of a, a tidal weight of an accumulation that has led us to where we are tonight. And so I just want to be sure to recognize the importance of Let's Grow and bringing all of this to pass. But there were indeed others engaged in the work who sponsored it, let it come to be. Uh, Superior Farms has been very instrumental, uh, particularly with Lisa Eidman's help. They were in, very much engaged in the harvesting and processing of the lambs at the end and some of the DNA technologies that we employed. NSIP has been involved from the very beginning with the selection of rams. We had support through Mountain States and All Flex and some of the equipment in tagging. So it was really a community effort that allowed this to come, uh, come to pass. So I want to gratefully recognize all of the sponsors that we have enjoyed. So with that, let me turn to outline the objectives. The current project really built on an exciting foundation. Back in 2016, there was a study in which there were some NSIP rams that had been identified as having a genetic advantage in weaning weight. And they were compared to uh, industry rams in terms of their performance. And at weaning time, on average, their lambs weighed three pounds more. And so there was a clear impact of having animals that were recognized of being of high genetic merit in terms of weight at weaning. And so that wet, whetted our appetite, I might say. Um, it was a, a, an interesting and useful result, but we thought it important to dig deeper, to try to look at the entire production system not only taking lambs up through weaning, and to do a little bit more in defining what, uh, what kinds of NSIP and industry rams we were actually taking a look at. And so we came up with three objectives, building on that earlier work that we thought important to consider. The first was to compare rams from a couple distinctive categories of NSIP, and I'll describe what those are momentarily, to industry rams that were, were also used. Secondly, we now wanted to evaluate the performance of the progeny of those rams all the way from birth to harvest, to the final product, so we could see the consequence throughout the uh, production cycle. And thirdly, with the evolution in some of our DNA DNA technologies, we wanted to try to utilize those in a commercial setting to see how they can enhance our opportunities when we think about utilizing genetics and selection in our production systems. So those were our three objectives. So let me talk a little bit about RAM selection. Between May to October 2017, and Bill Schultz, uh, enjoys a lot of the credit for this organization. There were 42 Suffolk rams that were identified to be used in the project. There were 15 rams that were drawn from industry. There were 13 rams that came out of the, came out of NSIP recorded flocks that had been identified for being high in their post weaning body weight. And I'll refer to those as weight rams throughout the presentation. There was another group, 14 NSIP rams, that had been identified as being high in their genetic merit for weaning muscle depth. And I'll refer to those rams as muscle rams. So we have these three groups, the industry group, the high weight group, and the high muscle group that we wish to compare. So let's focus a little bit on what I mean by high muscle and high weight. As a quick background, uh, an expected progeny difference is a value that it tells us uh, about the genetic merit of a ram as a parent. And it's easier to really think about it in terms of actual figures. So if we took it, uh, take a look at their first row, and these are values that were collected on these rams when they were selected back in August 2017. If we take a look at the weight category and the value of 5.4 in weaning, 
What that means is we expect the progeny of rams that have that 5.4 EPD to weigh on average 5.4 more pounds at weaning than the progeny of an average ram. If we step down to the next row and we think about the muscle rams and the value of two pounds for their weaning EPD, that means we anticipate that their progeny would weigh two pounds more on average at weaning than an average ram. And where this becomes so important is it then allows us to compare rams of different genetic categories or genetic groups. So if we look at the difference between the 5.4 and the two, what this implies is we would anticipate that the progeny of the weight rams to weigh on average 3.4 pounds more than the progeny than the progeny of the muscle rams. So we're allowed, it gives us the opportunity to actually compare the performance of these rams in a very formative way based on our estimate of their genetic merit. And if we continue down the columns, uh, we expect that the progeny of the high weight rams to weigh 6.4 pounds more on average at post weaning than the muscle. If we turn around and we take a look at some of the measures of muscle depth and fat depth, as we would expect, we would anticipate the progeny of the high muscle group to produce progeny with a deeper muscle than we would uh, those that are from the weight group. So we can use those figures to really compare what we see in practice to find out if our selection is actually working. And that was one of the goals of this project. To give us a little bit of confidence that these numbers were reliable, I went back and I took a look at the same set of rams from a genetic evaluation that was done a fair bit more recently, a couple years after that original selection. And what we see is the values are really very, very similar, particularly in how they differ. And so it gives us that much more reliability, that much more confidence that the difference that was achieved when these rams were selected really will persist and should appear in their progeny when they're used on the ground. So we chose the rams, we compared them based on their measures of genetic merit, and then sensibly we used them. And uh, I wanna recognize both Matt and Dan Mickle for being very much engaged in this project, allowing these rams to be used within their operations, which is really important because it makes it truly a commercial test. And so the, this work was done in U Utah at the Mickle Brothers Sheep Company. And 1,100 commercial white face ewes were bred to this group of 42 rams as a single group. So all 42 were put out with 1,100 commercial ewes for a relatively short breeding period for 17 days. So that would be a single estrus cycle. The intent was to really have a tight lambing because that helps us when we ultimately want to co compare the performance of their lambs. So lambing happened in April 2018. There are about 1,500 lambs born from nearly uh, 900 ewes that conceived to that breeding over a three-week period. A prolificacy was uh, quite good. On average, the ewes produced about 1.7 lamb of those lambing. They were lambed in a shed, and the reason is we wanted to be able to keep track of any cross-fostering that was being done. And very close to birth, we took a weight of those lambs, and we also tagged them with an EID. So a question comes up. I made the comment that all 42 of those rams got dumped in together with this full group of ewes. So how do we figure out who belongs to who? And this is where the DNA technologies come into play and are such a powerful tool for us to use within our industry. So let's talk a little bit about what we did with that DNA to try to determine the parentage of these lambs. DNA was, a DNA sample was collected on all the rams prior to breeding. 
And here's a picture of these activities. That's Rusty Burgett, who is there collecting blood. And Bill Schultz is putting that onto a blood card. So that's one of the ways that the DNA was sampled and collected. And then near birth using a, what is called a tissue sampling unit or a TSU, we took a small ear notch out of each of the lambs that serves as their DNA sample. And just as a heads up for where I think our industry will go, this technology, this development of a tissue sampling unit, I see that tr giving us a huge amount of flexibility to efficiently and quickly collect DNA samples on our animals. So we collected DNA either through a, a blood sample or through a tissue collected in this tissue sampling unit. So then what do we do with that? Well, we had what is called a genetic, a, a DNA panel that had 130, 163, excuse me, 163 genetic markers. And think of markers as just locations along an animal's genome that provide us some information about its underlying genetic makeup. So we identified 163 locations along the animal's genome that would tell us something about parentage. Now the way that technology is used, and this is an important caveat, is that we use this DNA panel and these markers not to actually assign a RAM to its progeny, but instead what we actually do is we exclude RAMs as not being possible sires. What becomes essential then when we're using these tools is that we make sure that every possible RAM, every possible sire that could have been a parent is actually sampled so that we have that full uh, contingent to consider. So one thing that I always recommend as we move into the genomic technology is to collect a DNA sample on those RAMs right at the point that they go out. So then we have a repository of all the RAMs that we could have used before we actually go uh, beyond the end of a breeding season. So we collected DNA on all the sires and we had DNA on all the lambs. So the question is how do we do these exclusions? How did this technology work? So let me show you a small illustration, a small example. We have a lamb and we have two potential sires, sire one and sire two. And I'm gonna look at just three of these genetic markers in our illustration. So it turns out that at a marker, this lamb carries an A and a B as its alleles. And at each marker, each animal will have a pair of alleles, which will be of whatever form they inherited from their parents. So this lamb happened to be an A and B. One of the sires was BB at that same marker. The alternative sire was AA at that, at that same marker. And so given that, either of those sires could have actually been the parent. A B could have been donated from the one sire, an A could have been donated by the other sire. So at this point in time, we can't delineate which of those sires was the actual parent. So we go to another marker, and this is why we need so many, because we need to look at the whole set of them to really uh, complete our, uh, our evaluation, our exclusion. So let's look at a second marker. At that second marker, the lamb is a big A, big A. At that marker, one of the sires is a big A, big A. The alternative sire is a big A, big B. Yet again, both of those sires could have contributed one of those A's to the lamb. So we're no more better off at this point in time in figuring out which of those two are potentially the sire of that lamb. So we'll go to a third marker. So in this case, the lamb is a BB. One of the sires at that third marker is an AB. The alternative sire is an AA. Well, the B could have come from sire one, but sire two has no B allele. And so in that case, sire one could be the sire, 
but we have been able to exclude SIRE 2. So that's the process we go through. We basically compare the 163 markers of all the SIRs compared to their LAMs. We exclude those that cannot work out, and then we fine tune to actually identify the RAM that we think is the best match to a particular LAM. So going through all that process, this is what we ended up with. Among the about 1,500 lambs that had DNA samples, we were able to align 92% of them. So we did a pretty good job of assigning a sire to a lamb based on these exclusions. And where it didn't work out, it wasn't inherently that there was a, a problem with the sire or the lamb. There, this is an this is biology. The process is not entirely perfect. And so in the lab, there are some issues with quality control. Sometimes DNA doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't work out the way we might anticipate. There's a, a quality issue. There's an idea called heterozygosity rate, which we won't get into, that can also cause some hiccups. So there are some holdups in the lab, but overall we did a really good job of aligning sires with lambs. So this is a commercial evaluation in a, a real production setting validating the utility of this tool. So given the fact that we could assign sires to lambs through this exclusion, we were then able to figure out who belonged to who. And this is what we saw in terms of the number of lambs sired by the individual rams. And this is something we'll come back to towards the end of the presentation, but I must admit this plot really troubles me. If we take a look at it, we have some rams that produced no progeny, and we had other rams that produced a lot of progeny. And this is true across all our three groups of rams, the industry, the muscle, and the weight. So something I believe we need to consider as an industry is what is the cause of this variability in the success rate of these rams? Clearly, we want them to produce lambs when we use them. So when we end up having very few out of some rams, it's an issue that I think we need to consider in a broader, broader sense. But one of the beauties of this technology and the project is we were actually able to look at this in, in this production setting. So then we move on to weaning. These lambs, once they were uh, came out of the lambing shed, out of the jugs, they went out onto the mountain. Uh, it was a relatively dry summer, so that it was not inherently the best of conditions in Utah that year. And this gets, shows you a couple pictures when these lambs came in to be weaned. And at weaning time, there was a, a 1,104 lambs that uh, came back off the mountains. And we used a Shearwell EID weigh crate. I had not had experience with it before this, but it was a remarkable morning. In four hours, we weighed over 11,000 lambs, which means they went through uh, at a rate of one lamb about every five seconds. So it was uh, quite a feat to work through that many lambs in, in such a, a quick pace. So I was very taken by the, by the technology. And when we think about how many lambs came home, there were about 1.3 lamb per ewe lambing at the point of time we got to weaning. So let's now focus in on what was the results, what were the performance of these animals. So let's first take a look at weight at weaning. On all of these ch uh, charts, I will use the same color code. The red will be the industry, the orange will be the muscle, and the weight will be this off green. So this is the performance of the progeny of sires within our three categories. We have pounds along the one axis. And what we see when we compare the average weaning weight of the progeny of these three groups of, of rams is that the uh, weight rams 
weaned lambs that on average weighed four and a half pounds more than those that came out of the muscle group. Pretty substantial difference. Another roadmap for me just to give you, these bars are what we call standard errors. And the best way to interpret them is if there is not an overlap between those bars, as you can see between the muscle and the weight group, that implies the difference is pretty substantial. That implies that is significant. So in this case, we clearly see a difference between the weight and the muscle group, and equally so, uh, a difference between the industry. It's not as dramatic, but it is uh, really a, a clear, clear advantage to the uh, weight sires. If we then take a look at daily gains, unsurprisingly, we see a very similar advantage. On average, the progeny of the weight, uh, the weight sires grew at 0.03 pound per day quicker than those of the muscle group. So is this what we expected to see? Early on, I carried on about these EPDs and that we can use them to predict what we should actually see in the lambs if we use these rams in practice. Let's go back to that chart. And in this chart, I'm looking at the uh, EPDs that were collected more recently in July, 2019. And what I did to create these figures is I weighted the results by the number of lambs out of each of the sires that were weaned. If one ram produced a lot more progeny than another, the comparison becomes unfair if I don't take that into account. So I weighted the values to take account of the actual number of lambs that were weaned by individual rams. So if we take a look at that, what we expect would be a difference between the weight and muscle group of 2.6 pounds, if this would be at weaning and the EPDs reflect weights that would be collected between, oh, say 45 to 90 days in these rams. If we look at post weaning, there was a five pound difference and those are in uh, rams that would be a bit older, 90 to 150 days. So the question is, how did the lambs do on the ground in comparison? So these are the actual weights of these lambs that were sired by these two groups. The difference was 4.5 pounds. They were on average around 161 days of age. It lines up really, really well. And so what we see is the impact of genetic selection. The difference we see between the weight and the muscle group is being expressed in the progeny when these rams were actually used in practice. This is a very, uh, promising, very exciting kind of result because this is what we anticipate to see and this is what we actually do see in practice. One of the things that uh, also came out of the project, not one of the direct focus areas, but is really important, is to think a little bit about what it means to produce more lambs. So what I'm showing on this is the individual weight in pounds of lambs that were born in different birth and rearing categories. So here are lambs that were born as a single and reared as a single, a lamb that was born as a twin yet reared as a single, and lambs that were born and reared as a twin. And unsurprisingly, we tend to see heavier weights on the single singles relative to say the twin twin. That's not surprising. But if we put it into context, the fact that the first two categories only wean a single lamb, while the third category weans two lambs, the counts are really important. We're actually weaning 100 pounds more simply by getting that second lamb all the way through to weaning time. So thinking about in our production systems about how we produce more lambs and rear them is really, really important. And this is depicted in a slightly different way in this slide here to the right. What I'm showing is the percent of the total lamb crop. The red is lambs that were born as singles. In the moment you'll see orange, those will be lambs that were born as twins. And then I have the numbers reared along the bottom. 
So here really what I'm showing is the number of lambs that were born and reared as a single and the numbers that survived and those that didn't. There was a loss of about 17% of those lambs that were born as a single, yet were not reared overall. Let's throw the twins on here. About 45% uh, of the lambs that were born as a twin were reared as a twin. There was a loss of about 21% uh, between those born and reared as a twin to those born as a twin and reared as a single. And then if we move to the those that uh, reared none that were born as a twin, there was a, a change of 24%. But appreciate that this bar off to the right-hand side, we have to double it because those coincide with two lambs being born. So the impact is substantial and we need to really keep this in mind when we think about our, uh, our production systems. So let's now move to the endpoint, to finishing. So we've talked about what happened at, at mating, at lambing, at weaning time. Let's now take them to the end product. So post weaning, these lambs are shipped to the Arthur feedlots for finishing. They were fed a, on, a, on a diet that was intended to achieve moderate rates of gain. And what they were taken out to similar weights and target condition and then drafted to be harvested. And they were actually drafted in six batches over the finishing season. So let's take a look at what that looks like. These are the, fin the six finishing dates early December, a little bit later in December, early January, mid-February, mid-March, and mid-April. The numbers that are on the bars are the actual numbers of lambs that were harvested at that particular endpoint. And what we see is the weights were relatively similar up until the very last group. And as is not unusual towards the end, there are a few of those lambs that were still kind of dragging along and they were then slaughtered in the last group to finish up the, the project. So that's what, what the weights looked like. But perhaps more interesting to all of us is to look at that in the context of our three groups of rams, the industry rams, the muscle rams, and the weight rams. So if we take a look at the, those animals that reach and finish earlier on, those tended to come out of the industry and the weight groups. Fewer animals that were coming out of the muscle group. We then move towards the middle. They tend to balance out a little bit more. But at that very end point, there were indeed more of the muscle sired lambs that took that little bit extra to reach finish. So one of the realities when we compare these groups is there is an impact on the amount of time it takes to feed them to reach a finished weight. At finish, the lambs were taken to Superior Farms for Slaughter and Dixon, and very kindly through Superior Farms, there was a tremendous amount of carcass information collected. And this is unique data for us to enjoy. They use their electronic grading system that uh, pro provides both yield and quality grades. We had carcass weights and there are a, a series of other carcass measurements that were and are being collected. To take a look at a picture of what this appears, we have a couple carcasses off to the left. The images are being taken of these to develop uh, these predictors of yield and uh, quality grades. Um, the OCC is our prediction of saleable meat yield. So one of the beauties of this technology is we can get estimates of saleable meat yield on individual carcasses. It's an extremely valuable bit of information. So this is what the carcasses look like. They are being split. We are taking some measurements about the uh, about the area of the, um, of the ribeye and some things about skin thickness and fat, and those results are still forthcoming. So let's now put this in the context of what happened at harvest. So again, same three colors, um, and now we're looking at the actual hot carcass weight of these lambs. 
And what we see when we compare the muscle group to, in this case, the industry, industry group, they actually generated 2.3 pounds more of actual hot carcass weight. So they were yielding a heavier amount of hot carcass. When we look at dressing percent, they're also producing a higher dressing percent. And this is a, one of the expectations that we have when we're selecting for higher muscle depth. One of the real impacts is an impact on dressing percent, and that then corresponds with actually achieving these higher hot carcass weights. So this very much is, is, in, is in line with what we would have anticipated. If we then move on to the saleable product, which is really what matters at the end, um, the muscle group generated 1.6 pounds more saleable meat yield than the industry and uh, also was, was more, than, more than the weight group. And if we think of carcass thickness, which is a, a indicator of quality grade, um, the, uh, we also, or I didn't mean to say quality grade of yield grade, the muscle group also ended up having a bit more fat thickness and a tendency to have a higher yield grade than the other two groups. So let me sum up what we've learned here. We were able to look at the progeny of NSIP sired rams and look at what we anticipated that they would do and actually compare it to what they did do, if I may, in a commercial setting. And this is what we saw. When we compared the high, uh, the high weaning weight to the high muscle group, there was an advantage of 4.5 pounds. And if we try to put that into the perspective of what it was actually worth, and these are some fairly recent feeder prices or feeder prices that I drew at the time the lambs were actually being weaned to make it relevant, that would boil down to earning an earning of somewhere between six and seven dollars more per lamb due to that extra weight weaned. If we multiply that across an industry, that's a substantial advantage. If we take a look at saleable meal yield, again, we saw an advantage of the high muscle group in terms of their saleable meat yield. And again, that equates to more product, more retail value and advantage to the overall industry. And so clearly the genetics worked. We saw an advantage in the predicted direction that corresponded really quite well with what we anticipated would have happened. When we compare the NSIP sired lambs to those from industry, on average, the progeny of the industry rams performed either intermediary or less than those that came out of NSIP. So it is a validation of the utility of thinking about formalizing our genetic selection programs, clearly one of the opportunities that NSIP offers to our industry. We also use DNA, and what we found is that using a DNA sample on sires and on their lambs, we were able to reliably assign parentage. That's a really valuable tool, particularly in more extensive production systems where we may have groups of rams that are being used to breed ewes. By collecting some of, the, some of these uh, DNA samples, we are actually able to figure out who belongs to who. And that can be really uh, a useful bit of information in our breeding programs. And clearly there is tremendous opportunity if we can increase the number of lambs that are reared, both born and reared as twins. Um, can't overstate the value of being able to increase the total lamb crop that we produce and wean as a way to impact the economic 
outcomes and efficiency of our industry. And I mentioned this tremendous variability in ram fertility. I find that troubling. I think it's something that we need to think about as an industry to understand why it's happening, trying to figure out what we might do, might do to try to accommodate or to mediate that as we move forward in thinking about our breeding programs. And there's a couple few more steps to go before we're before we're done. I hinted at that there are other carcass measures that are being uh, collected through superior farms, low eye areas, fat depth, skin thickness, these sorts of things. As we complete the project, we'll have those data to incorporate into our results. And we need to share these results widely. This is a uh, an important message and opportunity for our industry. I'm hoping this webinar is one way we're achieving spreading the news. We imagine presenting this information at the upcoming ASI convention in January. Uh, we're intending to produce a series of industry articles to, to be distributed, as well as a glossy pamphlet at the end, summarizing all of the results. And from a scientific standpoint, I think this really uh, has merit to think about putting into a scientific journal. There's a lot of very good work done to demonstrate the utility of selection at an industry level. And I think the scientific community will equally welcome receiving this sort of information. And so with that, I wanted to thank you and particularly the project team. Tom Boyer has been our leader throughout and has been the inspiration to draw this all together and make it come to pass. Uh, Rusty Burgett, Kim Chapman, Alan Cullum, Lisa Eidman, clearly Matt and Dan Mickle, and Bill and Susan Schultz have all been key to the success of what we have achieved. I also want to again recognize our sponsors, uh, Let's Grow and Superior Farms, who've been essential to what we've been able to do, and want to extend our thanks to the Mickle Brothers Sheep Company and Arthur Feedlots for collaborating with us in making this effort come to pass. And I want to thank Kyle uh, Bartain. He's one who kindly put together the photographs that we were able to use. I'm not much at the photograph end, so I certainly appreciate Kyle making those available to us. And I will stop there. And with our panel, many of the people who I just introduced a moment ago would be pleased to take any questions. I'll turn it back to you, Jay. Yes, I'm here, sorry. <laughs> For some reason, my computer decided to think there when you said that. So, yeah, we have uh, some panelists on here with us. And uh, with that, we have um, Bill Schultz is on joining us, Kim Chapman, Rusty Burgett, and Tom Boyer are all on with us. So I, I welcome those guys to the discussion. Um, I'd like to start by going back. There were some general questions that came in, and I was hoping you'd be able to address them, Ron, if you would, on the EP. D versus EBV question, as you can probably guess, that came in um, just in terms of the relationship between those two, and is there a reason why you were um, using EPDs? Some people were used to seeing EBVs. Yeah, I'd be happy to. An EBV is the genetic merit of the animal itself. So if we have a, a EBV of plus 10 for weaning weight, that means that that individual ram's genetic merit would be plus 10 pounds higher in weaning weight than another animal. So the EV is about the individual itself. But when we use an animal, we're really interested in their progeny. And since a ram passes one half of its genetics to its progeny, all an EPD is, is one half of that animal's EBV. And since in this study, we were really interested in looking at the performance of the 
progeny of these rams, it made sense to me to express the difference in terms of the progeny, which would take us to the EPD. So there's not magic between an EBV and an EPD. An EPD is just one half the EBV. It really is based on who we're interested in looking at, the individual itself, the RAM, or in our case in this study, its progeny, and that's where the EPD probably is more informative. Okay, thank you. Um, we also had some questions on, on the uh, rams themselves, in particular, you know, the wide variation in terms of fertility. Uh, people were asking about whether they're, whether the rams uh, were fertility tested or anything like that in terms of when they were brought in. Right, and I may uh, draw on some of the panel to help with some of the details of that. But no, the rams were not fertility tested when, when they uh, came on board. Okay, and the other half of that equation is the U's, and uh, some people were asking if there was any selection process to the U's, and I, I think I know the answer to that, but I'll let you and the panelists weigh in on how the U's were selected for this project. Let me take a step back if I may, Jay. I see that Tom's mic came on. Tom, did you have any comments about the rams when they arrived? Uh, yeah, the, when we brought the rams in, um, we did, we did pool them together, uh, all of the, um, the, uh, the, those rams with breeding values were pulled in. Some of the uh, industry rams were, were brought in later and even added right to the use. So they were, they were not all collected into one group. But all of the rams that were brought in did have a scrotal measurement taken and um, they were given a body score. Um, from a personal standpoint at this point, I do regret not taking a semen sample on all the rams and take full responsibility for that uh, not happening in the in that process. But uh, that was the way that unfolded. And then uh, all of the rams were put in the same day. They were all taken out the same day and they were replaced with white rams. So there was no question about uh, um, about what any future lambs that might have might have been sired by. And on the U question, I can answer that one too, Ron, if you don't mind. Um, uh, the Mickle brothers have their flocks divided into bands, and this band of 1,100 U's had been run together as a as a, a full band uh, consistently, and the full band was uh, made part of the project, so that there was zero uh, on an individual level level the band was selected because it was one of the larger bands and our goal was to get as much data as possible so as i recall it was the largest band of views that Mickels had that they uh, let us use in the program but tom it would be fair to say they were uh, a, a typical commercial white face to you that's correct Excellent. Thanks, Tom. And one more on the selection of the rams while we're talking about grabbing them here. Uh, Some asked about the uh, how were the NSIP rams selected? Was the price point predetermined or did you just get the average NSIP ram for $500? Was there anything else in there in terms of that selection? Right. I, I'm probably going to need to call on Bill for a little bit of help there because he kindly was taking the lead in the in the ram purchases. Uh, yeah, we, we did have a, a price point, and all the uh, people where we got the ramps from uh, gave their price to ramps at a discounted price. And we were uh, very selective on uh, the, where we uh, got our ramps. All the ramps needed to be genetically connected, as well as having uh, fall into the group of either a high muscle or a high uh, weight or growth uh, breeding value. So uh, we paid a lot of attention to where the rams come, came from and their breeding values. Thank, thanks, Bill. Um, so one of the questions was, uh, you know, on the slides that you had where you're comparing the output there, Ron, with the uh, differences between them, uh, the weaning weight matched expectation for NSIP growth versus muscle sires. 
but how did they compare to the industry? There was a few questions that came in just trying to compare the NSIP RAMs to the industry because, of course, you had the nice stats that showed you got what you expected between the two NSIP groups. Um, would you like to expand on that a little? Yeah, I can. I mean, the the challenge of trying to kind of pinpoint the genetic merit on the industry RAMs is we don't have the same kinds of figures for me to use uh, in the comparisons as the NSIP RAMs. Because we did have the EBVs and EPDs as I presented them, I could really work out what I expected up front, which is what we did, and we saw the results. In terms of the industry RAMs, we saw the results that we uh, achieved, uh, the comparisons that I presented in those slides, but I struggled to know what I expected to see because I don't have the, the same genetic information on those RAMs as I do on the NSIP RAMs. So that is a limitation in trying to make these comparisons. Okay, very good, thanks. A question on the slaughter time. At slaughter time, was a value per lamb assigned? And if so, how did it vary across the three sire lines? Did the weight rams have a higher value per lamb than the others? And if they did, how should the industry interpret this data? That's a long question, but. <laughs> so, right, I may need some help on this because I'm not sure I'm entirely following, but uh, I see Tom came on or off. Um, so the idea is what is the value of a ram given that they are producing progeny that are of yeah, what, creating a greater value product? Is that what I understand? Yeah, basically the value per lamb across there. You had a weight, I think you had a weight and a price in there at one point, but then you also talked to the carcass stuff, right? Let me back up if I made that slide might help in the discussion. I think we were here, yep. Yeah, so um, we had weaning weight values attached here. Oops. Looks like your PowerPoint's wanting to think on us. We can come back to that one if you like. I think that uh, to answer some of that, I think that uh, we'll have some of that data going forward um, because uh, Superior, uh, Lisa did at uh, Superior did uh, calculate uh, uh, those lamb values for us at slaughter because all of the lambs were weighed at, right at the slaughter for facility uh, and but right before they went across the floor. So we will have all of that. I guess the real key to this from my point of view and Bill and, and uh, uh, Rusty and others can weigh in on that, but uh, obviously the, the industry pays based on pounds of lamb right now. And in this case, the, the, the weight or the growth ram, the growth lambs uh, were those that uh, uh, probably brought in the most money. But you do have to take into account, we did have uh, a little more dressing percentage on the muscle sheep. And so again, we, we're still calculating some of those exact differences. But uh, I think that, I don't know, Rusty, do you and Bill have anything to add to that? Yeah, I definitely think there's there's still some more, I mean, data that can be teased out of this information. Uh, like you just said, there's some differences in dressing percent there, uh, but I think we need to dive uh, a little deeper into that because we know that there was some some fat thickness differences as well. So if we're talking about uh, you know putting out a, a quality product to the end consumer, I think we need to figure out how much of that difference was an increase in, in saleable meat versus how much was an increase in, in the fat thickness. And I, just, I don't think we're quite there yet on the, the analysis, but I think uh, I'm pretty sure Dr. Lewis is, uh, can be or, or is working on that. Yeah, it, a related question in terms of the difference between the muscle group and the weight group. Um, basically, the question is the muscle group, are they smaller, uh, mature size, and did that make any difference in terms of harvest time and, and uh, 
just related to, you know, ideal harvest time for those two different groups. I don't know if Ron wants to answer that or Tom. I'll take a stab of it. Um, some of the things that we learned uh, were interesting about those heavy lambs. Uh, we did have a couple of lambs on the mountain the day we, we, uh, we weaned those lambs and that, that were 160 basically, I uh, give or take a pound. Uh, we had some really nice heavy lambs in there. All of the lambs were sent to feedlot and those large lambs, those big 150, 560 pound lambs never did get back to the weight we got them on on the mountain that day. So there's a good lesson for us there. I believe that the project helps us to clarify that uh, we, we really need to figure out a way to get those those really large lambs that are ready to go to, to slaughter right to the processing plant off the uh, off of the mountain or off of uh, feed because uh, there's no point in sending them on feedlots. Um, the, the ration that was used on these lambs was, as pointed out, it was kind of a mid-range level uh, for, for mid-range weight gain. It was not a high-powered ration. It was more of a uh, to stretch them out. And so um, some of that information is yet to be all, all pulled out of there. But uh, basically what we find is that um, those weight, th those from the high weight group really do perform well uh, at post weaning as well. And then we as an industry need to determine where we really want to go with weight versus muscle. Uh, to me, that's one of the real keys to this whole thing is is uh, where, how much muscle do our emphasis do we want to place on muscle? What do our consumers want? What is the ideal uh, relationship between growth and muscle? And and uh, are those things we should investigate further with additional study? Okay. Thanks, Tom. I don't know if Ron. It looks like Ron's computer might have froze on him, which might have locked him out here. So. <laughs> We'll see if he gets that restarted and is able to rejoin the conversation. Um, there was a question here, and I hopefully, there he got it, I think. He'll get back in here. Okay. Um, oh, where was that? I lost it here a second. Uh, yeah. The, was there any correlation of RAM groups to the number of lambs sired? Um, I don't know if one of you guys would know that or if we need to wait for Ron to get back on. Okay, I'll go, I'll ask some uh, management questions here then. That yes. you can uh, one of them was, were, were any of the ewes, were the ewes flush prior to breeding, basically? Rusty or Tom? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Maybe Tom would, uh, Tom would know. I'm pretty certain they were just, uh, they were on the alfalfa stubble um, immediately prior to breeding. Um, the same stubble that they were, they were bred on. Okay. All right. Yes, um, I was talking to, to, uh, um, to Ron on the phone there. He's trying to get back on. But to answer that okay. question, that we're all put on alfalfa stubble, and that was one of the issues that, uh, that limited the uh, number of days we were able to use those ram lambs as alfalfa stubble made them uh, get lame. And so when Mickles felt that enough of them were lame, that we were not getting a good uh, coverage on the user, giving them a fair shot, then all of them were pulled at the same time. But everything was done on alfalfa stubble. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to... to find some more management questions. A lot of these are technical questions. Hmm. 
So I don't know if one of you guys wants to address this or not, but somebody asked, do I understand correctly that if my goal is to sell lamb meat, I should choose muscle group sires for more yield and higher quality meat? Is that a correct interpretation of what we're seeing? Rusty, do you want to talk to that or? Oh, I can give it a stab. Um, I think uh, looking at the the uh, graphs that Ron had presented with the uh, the advantages uh, in, in pounds of saleable meat to the the muscle type rams, um, I think that would certainly point uh, to that um, that rationale. But I think one of the other issues is uh, you also see the increase in the fat thickness. Um, so I think. Uh, we need to dive into a little bit uh, more before we make that determination. Okay. Um, somebody asked just a general question. What does hot carcass mean? Um, what do you guys want to give the explanation of what that is meant to represent? Sure. I mean, the hot carcass weight is simply the, uh, the whole carcass weight after it's gone through the uh, the harvesting process. So it's right off of the, the harvest floor uh, after those carcasses have been uh, dressed, uh, trimmed and cleaned. So it's uh, you know, prior to them uh, going through the uh, into the chill box. OK, so then while we're on that, when Ron talked about the cutout value of that, um, what was the question was, what was a standard cutout to get saleable meat when he mentioned that? Uh, number and how much was boneless versus bone in? Is there was there a standard there, or how was that determined? I don't know for certain. I'm, I'm pretty sure though that the saleable meat calculation came from the the instrument grading from the camera grading, um, and I believe that was through the uh, the ovine uh, cutability, uh, the OCC yield. Okay, thank you, Tom. Do you know if that's any different? I, I'm fairly certain that's what it was from. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. Um, and back to the RAM, somebody asked about the, uh, I, I don't know if this was collected, I assume it wasn't, but was, did anybody look at the dominance of the RAMs uh, during breeding? Uh, were the, I guess the natural question were, would be were the industry RAMs like more dominant or not in terms of the breeding behavior, I guess is more so than getting things bred. To my knowledge, there was no attention paid. They were just turned in and the herders managed the use as they do on a consistent basis with all the herds. Um, so no, um, no details were kept of, of any kind regarding the rams activity uh, in the, while they were in the use during the breeding period. Okay. All right. I'm not, seeing, let's see. I, I can hear you now, Jay. Back hey, on. you rejoined us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not sure what happened. It looked like your uh, your computer froze up on us there. It did indeed. I apologize for that. I don't know what happened. Okay. It just all went black. All right. Um, so there were some questions on the uh, genetic stuff. Um, one of them was okay. the uh, um, that 163 marker panel. Somebody yep. asked a question about how accurate that is if you, if they have an extremely inbred population. Does that really make that difficult to do? Right. Th that, there we go. Um, right. That panel was designed by Mike Heaton and his colleagues at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center. And they used a, really quite a diverse and comprehensive set of U.S. sheep in its design and tested it in a variety of ways. And it proves to be really quite reliable. Now, if we have extremely high levels of inbreeding and um, limited amounts of information, for example, if we only know the sire and the lamb and not the sire the ewe and the lamb 
there may be some cases where um, excluding individuals becomes more difficult, but that in some ways is the, the beauty of this exclusion approach is that if enough of the markers are not consistent to show that that sire could be the sire of that animal, um, it will be, it would be, uh, the assignment would not be made. So it's been very well tested based on U.S. sheep uh, genetics uh, in a diverse set of breeds and has proven to be extremely reliable in, in, in normal settings. Okay. And then there was a question that um, on the uh, twin versus singles and then going across the three breeding groups, the three uh, sets of rams, was there information available on that in terms of of just basically, you know, the, I know you put up the one on the number of lambs born, but. Uh, so yeah. have I actually subdivided that relative to the category of ram? Yeah. In terms of uh, whether they twinned or singled. I, I, have, I have not. Um, I would find it surprising that we would see a difference there since uh, much of the litter size is going to be a function of the U. Uh, where we would see the issue arising would would be more on you know a ram being fertile or or otherwise, uh, but I have not looked at that formally, so I I can't uh, I can't give an explicit answer to that. Okay, and then more of an NSIP question in general. These were all Suffolk grams, correct? The NSIP ones. Is it? They were. Okay. So um, if you want to just kind of summarize, somebody asked, you know, the work being done in terms of the numbers across breeds and the resulting growth. What we saw here in terms of the growth and, and the uh, weight and and, um, and muscle. Um, so they were asking for a comparison from Suffolk to Hamp to Columbia. And you want to give them a elevator speech on <laughs> comparing those? <laughs> So the view is whether or not we would see similar kinds of results. Yeah, uh, it just right. inter it basically how did the numbers compare across these different breeds? Where you had all Suffolk breeds that were selected for uh, weight or muscle, um, right? You know, do you, what kind of variance do you see across breeds? Is kind of the question. Perhaps a couple ideas there. First of all, um, EBVs or EPDs, however we wish to express them. They aren't directly comparable across breeds. Um, they are done with on a within breed basis, so we can't. An EBV in a Suffolk has a different uh, of a value has a different meaning than an EBV in a Columbia or in a Hamp. There is some work being done to try to figure out to, how to come up with adjustment factors to make those comparables, but but they can't be directly compared. That said. If we had selected Columbia Rams based on weight or based on muscle, and we had their EBVs or EPDs, and we looked at the difference between them, I have every expectation we'd see very similar kinds of results in their progeny. So it's really about the comparison, the difference between the, the two groups that, that matters. And so I think that would be extremely reliable. I can't really comment about how um, the different breeds compare because that's just simply not um, quite the way the uh, the way that process works in estimating those breeding values. So somebody asked why, you know, because we saw high growth, high muscle, uh, you know, kind of trading off with one another. Somebody says, why do we yeah. see that? Why do we see high growth in ram growth rams with very low muscle score and vice versa? I think part of it is when we're selecting animals for very different criteria. So a high growth animal is being selected for growth rate. And they're typically going to a, a larger endpoint, a larger mature size. An animal that's being selected for very specific uh, carcass traits that might relate to the shape or size of certain muscles, they're being selected in a different way, in, in a different direction, if I may. And so we're talking about, um, in a way, comparing uh, a different endpoint on these animals. I'll give you an illustration of this. Um, 
when we select animals for larger mature size, at any given weight, those animals will be physiologically less mature. So if I'm selecting an animal to be bigger and we compare it at some early weight, compare it to an, whatever that weight might be, we'll say it's 120 pounds. But that animal's endpoint is to be much larger. If we're selecting an animal uh, based on another set of criteria that isn't growing to that same final size, at that same weight in their progeny, at that same 120 pounds, they are physiologically more mature. They're closer to their endpoint because they're not growing to as large of a size. And so we get caught up with this conundrum, this comparison when we're selecting animals for larger size versus selecting them for composition of the carcass. So they're, they're different endpoints, they're different goals, and so we end up producing carcasses that are reflecting the difference in those selection endpoints. Okay, good. Does yeah. that help? Yeah, yeah, we've got a lot of, a lot of people are asking about that trade-off, so that helps quite a bit. Um, okay. And uh, somebody asked, you touched on the difference uh, time on feed between the groups. Have you calculated the average time on feed for the three groups? And there's an interest in, you know, seeing how that affects the economics of them. I, I, I've looked at that briefly, and indeed it takes um, more days to get the muscle group to the to that final endpoint than it did, for example, the uh, weight group. And we're talking in the range of a, of a couple of weeks on average. Um, one of the challenges is that, as you could have, as you saw in, in that chart, where we had the three different endpoints, that those endpoints are being driven by some balance of weight, some balance of condition, and some balance of needing to have enough lambs to go forward to. Uh, to be killed through superior farms. And so it wasn't a precise selection criteria that drew those lambs off that went. So there's a little bit of ambiguity built into that because they weren't being marketed at a really fixed endpoint, not at a, a fixed weight or at a fixed level of condition. And so the best we can do is approximate the additional number of days that would take them higher muscle versus the industry versus the higher weight group to get to the endpoints that we actually uh, saw. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, boy, I'm gonna have to send you something. We got a lot of questions on here and I know we're about out of time, but just on that very... Well, I apologize for getting knocked off, no, so I, but I'm no, happy to stay on. That's fine. There's a lot of questions on the meat side and the endpoint and all that stuff, so that's very good. I, will, I do have... Uh, um, Oh, now I lost it here. I got too carried away. One last question here that I was going to ask. Wasn't the feedlot? Uh, oh, I know. It was on the on the rams. Um, another question on a selection of the were these all ram lambs? Was the question? They were. They were. There was some, um, you know, some were earlier or later born, but they were all within a few months of each other in, the, in their birth dates. Okay. All right. So, so they fit into the ram lamb category, to be clear. Right. Okay. Yeah, and most of these are things that you didn't, don't have the data brought up yet on, but a lot of questions on the feed efficiency and, and uh, mm -hmm. how they performed in the feedlot. So... So if we one of the get to one that. of the challenges that we have is we don't actually we don't know how much they ate individually. Right. So what we have is the length of time to to this endpoint um, in the feedlot. So feed efficiency is a challenge because we don't know how much they ate as a group, let alone individually. So the best that we'll be able to do is to say they took longer or otherwise based on their. Uh, sire category mm -hmm. okay 
All right. Well, I th we've used up our time. I appreciate you making the effort to get back on. Uh, those computer issues can always be a pain. So I appreciate you doing that, Ron. It was a great presentation, a lot of good information and a lot of interest from, from the people out there on uh, on this study and all the possibilities for, uh, you know, future information come out of this study or, or ones that get uh, added on afterwards here. So our panelists, um, Tom or Rusty, um, Kim, Bill, I appreciate you guys all all getting on here. Uh, do you guys have any uh, parting comments? Tom, I see you unmuted your microphone. You like to uh, weigh in here at how this project went and maybe uh, its importance to the industry? I just really think it's a great project to to bring technology and and data to the forefront of the industry and help us move off the plateau we've been on. Uh, for what seems like decades, um, we will have more, and that hopefully we. I, I'm confident we'll have a complete uh, summary of the project by the time we get to ASI there in January at the convention. Uh, so I would invite uh, all to be part of that uh, presentation, and we can discuss the questions in more detail there, and and uh, hopefully uh, clarify any any issues that are out there. Thanks, Tom. And and all all I really appreciate all the people that put in these great questions. I, I will compile these and I'll, I'll get them to our research team here, and uh, we'll try to address as many as we can. I'm sure they will with with the information they have. But it certainly provides a lot of food for thought on on uh, things that people would like to see figured out. So, uh, Ron, once again, thanks for for sharing with us tonight. Uh, this is really an exciting project, and uh, you know, thanks again to the Let's Grow Committee for all of their support for this project and for the webinars that we're putting on and all these other things, all in an effort to uh, help grow the industry and, and grow it profitably. So, uh, so appreciate uh, the American Sheep Industry ASI for. Uh, sponsoring this and uh and we encourage all of you guys to check them out at sheepusa.org and uh, ron any parting thoughts just to say uh thank you for the opportunity and to really recognize the team that's been engaged in it the, all of our sponsors uh, as well as the panelists and the others who have really make this come to come come to pass it was a huge effort and i think the results are very exciting for our industry Okay, thank you, and, and good evening, everybody, and uh, everybody uh, enjoyed the rest of what's left of the night.